Good day, everyone. Today is Holy Saturday. As part of Christian community, together with all other believers in the body of Christ, we are commemorating the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and internalizing its significance in our lives. This Holy Week, let us use this as an opportunity to come closer to God and be carried in the arms of His grace, most especially in this season of our nation's history. Let's begin by worshiping Him through songs. Jesus, what a wonder you are. Jesus, what a wonder you are. Jesus, the most powerful. Have you ever wondered why the wise men, during the birth of Christ, brought myrrh as one of the three gifts they gave to Him? This is also what Nicodemus brought during the burial of Christ as he accompanied Joseph of Arimathea. It must have great significance that was given attention by the writers of the Gospel. Throughout the Jewish custom and history, myrrh fragrance was being used in a burial body of a dead person. Same thing was used in the dead body of Christ. Therefore, myrrh has been the symbol of his suffering and death. If you have ever smelled myrrh, many said it is fragrant, aromatic, earthy smell like no other. To obtain the resin that produces the fragrance of myrrh, the tree bark must be cut, must be wounded, must be bruised. In fact, the harvester would say he is making the tree bleed. And guess what those drops of resin are called? The drops of myrrh resin are called tears. Ever feel so cut or wounded by the circumstances of life that it feels like you're bleeding to death? Christ himself bleed to death and drop his blood because it is the only way for us to see the greatest fragrance of his forgiveness that cleanses and purifies our soul. It is also the fragrance of His presence that brought us near to Him to worship Him and experience His healing hands in times that our souls are also bleeding. Let us read from our text and see how, they, how this myrrh played its symbolic meaning in Christ's death. Let us read John chapter 19, beginning verse 38 up to 42. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths, with the spices, at, as is the custom or burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Joseph of Arimathea, asked Governor Pilate for the body of Jesus as soon as Jesus died. Because Jesus died at about 3 p.m. And because the Sabbath began at about 6 p.m., Joseph had a three-hour window of opportunity to prepare and return Jesus' body. Joseph knew that they would be unclean for seven days because they touched Jesus' dead body. So he took Jesus' body down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a tomb 
cut in stone, where no one had ever yet been laid. I would like to focus our eyes a bit on the two, on two people who witness the truthfulness of Christ's death. It's Joseph, Arimathea, and Nicodemus. According to similar account in Luke chapter 23, Joseph was member of the council in Jerusalem and was part of the Sanhedrin. These were the ruling council of the land. He was a good and righteous man who was not allowed himself to be used by corrupt leaders because he had not consented to their plans to put Jesus to death. Perhaps Joseph was not invited in the secret meeting and mock trials. Most probably, he was not asked to come in order for them to have the unanimous decision. It was also said that Joseph was looking for the kingdom of God. No wonder why he had an overwhelming faith that enabled him to have the courage to ask the governor Pilate to take the body of Jesus. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee and ruler of the Jews, the one who came to Jesus at night in John chapter 3 and became a secret follower of Christ. They could no longer hide their passion for Christ. They felt in their heart that regardless of whether they would be removed from their respective positions or be condemned by many, they had to do the right thing that would please God. But Joseph and Nicodemus witnessed that Christ died and placed him in the tomb. They saw his suffering and the clear message of Christ's ultimate sacrifice was communicated through his death. Indeed, the reality of God's kingdom became evident in their lives. They must be going against all odds, especially to the ruling council of Sanhedrin and also to the rest of the Pharisee that both Joseph and Nicodemus represent respectively. But that did not stop them from carrying the body of Jesus and do the Jewish custom of burial anointing it with the mix of myrrh, spices, and ointments. Their life's courage of boldness is a testimony of the power of the gospel living inside them as a disciples of the Lord Jesus. This only shows that the gospel message could transform a man and enable them to stand their faith and do the right thing at the right time regardless of the opposing circumstances. Joseph and Nicodemus were an actual witnesses who could testify about the truthfulness of Christ's death without any iota of doubt. Some opposition believed that Christ did not really die but only lost his consciousness and later in the tomb was revived. Denying the truth about Christ's death is a blatant lie that would hurt the Christian faith of all time in history and diffuse the hope of all people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, For I received to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, in accordance with the Scriptures. In verse 4, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And in verse 17, And if Christ has, has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Because we know that Christ died and rose again on the third day, the seeming certainty of death on our part actually paved the way for the hope of our victory. Death is certain to all because of sin. And if Christ did not die for us nor raise from the dead, our faith is futile. Everything is a waste and all believers in all generations are at a loss. This truth of what transpired on the cross should transform our lives the way Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus did. Let us have the courage to demonstrate what we are believing and stop from being a secret disciples, hiding our faith because we are afraid of negative consequence. Instead, let us preach the gospel without any shame and declare that Jesus conquered death and sin. Let us proclaim and spread the truth about our redemption that sets people free and let everyone know that Jesus is the conquering King that has been, that has been raised from the grave and gave us the hope of victory.
Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You redeemed us by your own precious blood that was poured out on the cross. We believe we are saved and have an eternal life through faith in Christ. We acknowledge that indeed you are the Lord and Savior of our lives. We love you and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining our Holy Week Devo. If you like this video, go ahead and share it. Have a great day.